Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisance to Sobh Dasha Shri Prabhupada. Welcome to devotees from Morning Bhagavatam class. This morning we will be discussing from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 17, verses 21 and 22. And the chapter is entitled, The Punishment and Reward of Kali. And we are very happy to have His Holiness Chandramali Swami with us. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All Dasha Prabhupada and all glories to you Maharaj. Thank you, honestly, and my obeisance to you and all the devotees. Very respectful to the Prabhupada. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Sutta Uvaj Evam Dharma Parada to Sam Samrad to the Satamaham Samadhi Kainam Rasa Viveka Arthya Astaham. Translation Sutta Goswami said, the best in the Brahmanas. The Emperor Pariksit, thus hearing the personality of the religion speaking, was fully satisfied and without mistake or regret, he gave his reply. Purport. The statement of the bull, the personality of religion, was full of philosophy and knowledge, and the king was satisfied. Since he could understand that the suffering bull was not an ordinary one, Unless one is perfectly conversing with the law of the Supreme Lord, one cannot speak such things touching philosophical truths. The emperor, being also on an equal level of sagacity, replied to the point without doubts or mistakes. So here, we'll go before we go on number two, I want to, number two, I want to comment a little bit on this for this here. Um, it's interesting that uh, <laughs> now the bull has now been revealed his real identity as the personality of Godhead through Maharaj Bhrithi was questioning him why, what is the cause of your suffering and those of you who have been here for previous verses you understand that the bull didn't give any direct answer. He gave possibilities or conjectures what could be the cause of suffering. He covered many different possibilities. Now, after hearing everything from the bull, Maharaj Parikshit was really satisfied and then he could understand. And then this next verse, he responds. Rajo Vacha, Dharma, Bhavasi, Dharma, Gya, Dharma, Sri Vishru, Padrik, Gya, Dharma, Pritam, Staram, Tucha, Katsyati, Tan, Bhavit. The king said, O oh, you who are in the form of a bull, you know the truth of religion, and you are speaking according to the principle that the destination intended for the perpetrator of irreligious acts is also intended for one who identifies the perpetrator. For none of you are none other than the personality of religion. I'll read that again. The king said, Oh, you who are in the form of a bull, you know the truth of religion. You are speaking according to the principle that the destination intended for the perpetrator of irreligious acts is also intended for one who identifies the perpetrator. You are none other than the personality of religion. Purport. The devotee's conclusion is that no one is directly responsible for being a benefactor or mischief monger without the sanction of the Lord. Therefore, he does not consider anyone to be directly responsible for such action. But in both the cases, he takes it for granted that either benefit or loss is God's sin, and thus it is his grace. 
In case of benefit, no one will deny that it's God's sin. But in case of loss or reverses, one becomes doubtful about how the Lord could be so unkind to his devotee as to put him in great difficulty. Jesus Christ was seemingly put into such difficulty, being crucified by the ignorant, but he was never angry at the mischief mongers. This is a way of accepting a thing either favorable or unfavorable. As for a devotee, they identify as equally a sinner, like the mischief monger. By God's grace, the devotee tolerates all reverses. Maharaj Pariksit observed this, and therefore he could understand that the bull was not other than the personality of religion himself. In other words, the devotee has no suffering at all because the so-called suffering is also God's grace for the devotee who sees God in everything. The cow and the bull never placed any complaint before the king for being tortured by the personality of Kali. Although everyone lodges some complaints before the state authorities. The extraordinary behavior of the bull made the king conclude that the bull was certainly the personality of religion. For no one else could understand the finer intricacies of the codes of religion. Thus, my Sri Gurudeva Mahanamam Vishnu Bhagai Krishna Postaya Bhutai Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nuti Mahini Namaste Saraswati Vedanta Gauravani Pacharini Virse Sansunya Vadi Pasyatya Vesitarani Vansha Kalpa Tulu Vishya Vipa Sindhu Vedanta Pitanam Pavane Vyal Vaishnava Vyalam Jai Shri Krishna, Deitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadahar, Sudhasadi Gaur, Bhakta Vrindam Hare, Krishna Hare, Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So the response that the bull, who is now being revealed as the personality of religion himself, is um, in line with very subtle philosophical truths that no ordinary person could perceive of. Therefore, Maharaj Pariksit could understand that this bull is simply in disguise of a bull. He is the personality of religion himself. And therefore, he congratulates him by explaining actually the purport of all of the verses that were gone before, or all of the statements made by the bull, which was conjectures or ideas that, well, suffering comes by higher powers, suffering comes by, by one's previous karma, come, suffering comes by providence, some comes by suffering comes by one's activity, some kind of suffering comes by material nature. So the bull went through a whole list. And he never said that this is the answer. He said, some say it's this way, some say it's this way. Different philosophers, different religionists will uh, give their understanding or conclusion of how things work in a certain way. And many times, not many, but sometimes it becomes contrary. But here the contradictions are uh, amalgamated into this final statement. That no one can understand who, where the actual suffering is coming. And Prabhupada really says, it's God's sin. <laughs> it's God's sin. In a similar statement, Srila Prabhupada said that, said, don't be disturbed by the instrument of your karma. And very, uh, Interesting statement. Don't be disturbed by the interest the instrument of your karma. In other words, there is a person or a situation that puts in place in order to give you what you need to receive. And therefore, to blame the person who apparently is giving it, or even the circumstances that have brought it about, cannot really answer the reason why it's coming. 
nor the cause behind it either. Because the laws of nature are so subtle and um, everything works accordingly. We give an example when uh, Dhritarashtra, after the battle of Kurukshetra, all of his hundred sons had been killed. The Pandavas were victorious. And now uh, he was in a very lamentable and very pitiable situation, being the relative of the Pandavas at the same time. Now completely defeated and lost everything that was dear to him. And so there is one statement coming from the Mahabharata by which it says that Dhritarashtra approached the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna. He knew Krishna was the Supreme Lord, although he's playing the role of his nephew. And uh, he said, my dear Lord, you know, I had a hundred sons and they all died. I was born blind. What was my karma? Why did I have to go through that? And Krishna, who's the all-knowing personality of that, gave the answer. And he rightfully said, he said, 50 lives ago, you were a hunter and you shot a arrow, flaming arrow, into a nest of birds with a hundred birds in the nest. All the birds died by the fire, but the mother bird got away and she was blinded by the fire. So Dhritarashtra was somewhat shocked to hear that. But then the shock also continued by responding. And he said, why 50 lives? Why it took so long for this karma to come? And Krishna gave the answer explaining how karma works, at least to some degree, because no one can understand how the laws of karma work. And they're so intricate that even Krishna says, I don't explain them. And then he said, well, it took you 50 lives to build up enough as to have a son means to have good karma. That is a feature of good karma. If you have a, if, you, if there's a son born in your family, then that is an example of one's good karma. And so it took you 50 lives to have a hundred sons and have enough good karma. And then when it was time, the karma you cashed in. In other words, you got the reactions of your activities. So this story kind of illustrates how subtle the activities of material energy work onto the living entity. And there's two things. One is one's karma, and the other one is the will of God. Two verses illustrate, or at least one verse illustrates very clearly that God allows or wants, he has two wills. He has permissive will and he has his direct will. He may want something to happen and it will happen or something is happening by the arrangement of material energy, which is his arrangement anyway. He doesn't interfere with that arrangement. It's like a, a watchmaker who makes a clock, a watch, and he puts it in motion and the clock works according to the watchmaker's you know, calculation. But the watchmaker doesn't interfere with the workings of the clock because the clock is working under his direction. But the clock is still working automatically without the watchmaker being directly involved with the, the on-the-spot activities. So in the same way, the uh, Krishna will allow certain things to happen to a devotee for a reason. Or Krishna may arrange something to happen to a devotee, which we're talking about something that apparently seems to be unfavorable. 
because as Prabhupada mentions in this paper, we designate things as favorable and unfavorable because we have set up a standard by which we live by, and we accept that standard and we we respond accordingly. But whenever anything is arranged by the Lord, it's not unfavorable, it's always favorable, but it may appear to be unfavorable. Therefore, that verse in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, this verse is spoken by Lord Brahma when he's explaining how that uh, when suffering comes upon the, the living entity, he understands that that suffering has been orchestrated by God himself. And there's a reason why, and it's beneficial, because God only, Krishna only, works for the benefit of everyone. He never does anything for anyone's, uh, let me say, demise or uh, something. He never allows things to be unbeneficial for others. Everything is always beneficial, no matter how it plays itself out. Just like when he kills the demons, that's beneficial for them because it stops their demonic activities and it frees others from the effects of their demonic activities. Now, Krishna always acts for the benefit of everyone, but people can't see that. And therefore, they say this is good and this is bad. But for a devotee, everything is good. And for a non devotee, Things may be simply happening because of the way they act. And therefore, from a material perspective, it's what they deserve, although it's not good. It's just the reactions of their activities. But the devotees don't have karmic reactions, at least for those who've been practicing Krishna consciousness for some time. When we first get involved with devotional service, we may be experience some of the results of our karma. But that, that experience is just a slight uh, manifestation of the actual full force of that karma. For instance, Prabhupada said that you may have been a, you may have killed somebody in your previous lives and you haven't paid the debt for that. Yet. So now you, somehow you made it to devotion or service or became a devotee. And so you're in the kitchen and you're doing some cutting of the vegetables and you're a little inattentive and you cut your finger and your finger is cut. So there's some suffering that comes with that. But that suffering is mitigated by the power of devotional service. Therefore, if we had to experience the full force of our karma, we wouldn't be able to perform devotional service. There might be too much material success coming our way or too much material suffering coming our way. And therefore, we can't focus on devotional service. Therefore, Krishna mitigates both of these to a minimum. And as the devotee continues to practice devotional service, at one point, all of that karmic you know, activity stops with no more karma. And if a devotee gets some kind of situation where it appears to be unpleasant, then the devotee thinks, oh, Krishna is teaching me something. He's purifying me from something. It's something that I need to learn, something I need to grow, grow from. Me. And therefore, that verse is that the devotee prays to the Lord, my dear Lord, thank you very much. I actually deserve much worse than what you have given me, but because you are so merciful, you're only giving me a small verse for me. Therefore, the devotee takes shelter of devotion to service and worships the Lord with more devotion. So here we're seeing, um, but the tendency of the conditioned souls and even those in devotional service who are not aware of the principles is that there are good and bad. But for a devotee, nothing is bad. Everything is ultimately meant for the devotees progress. Even if a devotee dies, there is a reason why that is beneficial for them at that particular time. 
Of course, one should not do anything to act outside of the instructions of the, of the Lord and the spiritual master. If you do something foolish, you can't blame it and call it Krishna's mercy. For example, uh, in the very beginning of the Hare Krishna movement, the devotees in New York were uh, uh, negotiating buying another building at the time, and Srila Prabhupada was there. So they met this gentleman, Mr. Price, and he was an agent to sell the building. And he, he, he met the devotees. And he was telling the devotees, there are other buyers also, but I like you guys. I really want to give you guys the building. The Prabhupada kind of suspected this Mr. Price wasn't, uh, you know, really telling the truth. He had his own program. The Prabhupada had to go to Los Angeles at the time. So he told the devotees, don't give Mr. Price any money until the deal is closed. No matter if he asks us for money in advance, don't give it to him. Say so you'll only give once the deal is closed. The devotees heard that. And then Prabhupada went to Los Angeles. And then uh, Mr. Price took the opportunity and said, you know, um, there's this other buyer. He really wants this building. I want to give you. You give me $5,000 and I guarantee I'll hold it for you and this other buyer will not be able to have it. So the, the bodies were told by Prabhupada not to do that, but they did it anyway. They wrote a check for $5,000 and gave it to Mr. Price. And then there was a phone call. And Prabhupada was there and they were discussing. And they said to Prabhupada, we gave Mr. Price $5,000 to hold the building for us. Prabhupada said, stop payment on that check immediately. So they went to the bank. But the bank, had a, Mr. Price had already cast the check. They went to Mr. Price's office. His office was vacant. He was cleaned out and left down. And the devotees now were completely devastated. And then they were talking to Prabhupada, they were apologizing. And then one devotee said, well, it was Krishna's arrangement. Prabhupada really got angry when they said that. He said, I told you not to give him any money. Now you can't say it's Krishna's arrangement, it's your stupidity. So here's an example of something going wrong when one doesn't follow the proper guidance. And you can't say it's Krishna's arrangement. It's not. It's like if you say, well, there's a very, it's like people tell me, you know, devotees preach in Vietnam. And they say trying to cross the street in Vietnam during the traffic is impossible because the traffic is so fast. And it's always coming. And so the person thinks, well, I'm just going to cross anyway. And, uh, you know, I'll just depend on Krishna to make it. <laughs> that would be foolish. <laughs> so the story ends with Mr. Price that Prabhupada did get back there. And Prabhupada worked really hard. And he was able to recover two thousand dollars of the five thousand. The other three thousand were lost. <laughs> so here's an example of how something may happen, and we're thinking, "Well, this is nice. this is... no, it's not." You have to follow the practical guidelines and live accordingly. And you might say, "Well, how do we know?" If some instruction is given, it becomes clear. But one needs to have to use their common sense in ordinary dealings and not act against the common law, the common rule. And if you are sincerely working in that way, 
and something happened, obviously, you can take it as an arrangement of Krishna in order to bring one to a higher stage of bhakti, to teach one some very important spiritual principle, or to detach one from material activities more. And there's many reasons why things go wrong. You know, sometimes we get sick and then uh, we think, oh, why, why did I get sick? And, well, maybe because you acted wrongly, and therefore you got sick. Or maybe Krishna is putting you in that situation because there's something for you to learn. But even if it was due to your acting wrongly as a devotee, there's always something to learn. There's always something to learn in order to avoid further complications or suffering. But as Srila Prabhupada says here, when something nice happens, in other words, something we like, we thank God and we say it's all God sent. And when we do something wrong, we uh, we uh, like to blame it on God also. But whatever he does is perfect. So this particular one should study these series of verses, starting from I think four or five verses prior, because it's really the foundation of an interesting philosophical discussion. What is the cause? And the bold answers. But here it says that ultimately coming by the arrangement of God through either directly or indirectly through the material energy or for a devotee through the spiritual energy. In any case, it's always it's uh, because. And you'll you'll as you go on with the verses, you'll see some interesting purports, Prabhupada. Really comes to the point of saying, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, everything's happening by the arrangement of Krishna. So if you want to bring blame anybody, blame Krishna. But no, but that's not the way to go either, because that doesn't solve the problem. Krishna is not the cause. Krishna says, I am not the cause of anyone's happiness or distress in the two of them. Everything is due to the two modes in the two of them. Okay, this is an interesting um, particular series of verses. And we always think, wow, I'm suffering. This person, she caused me suffering. This person caused me suffering. Uh, I can see this person said something and I am suffering, therefore it's their fault. And like that. So we get much, we get very much uh, clear, at least we think we're clear, we blame a particular situation or a particular person for when something doesn't go our way or causes us some suffering. But that that's destroyed by this statement given by Maharaj Richard. But he shows that the, no one but the personality of religion could understand these subtle truths. No one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so questions or comments? It's an interesting section of the Bhagavatam, the cause of suffering. Maharaj, this is a powerful. I apologize, Marge. Marge, you, before I could say anything, their hands have gone up because I know this class is going to stir up questions. And I'm so glad that you chose to speak on this class, Maharaj. It is amazing. I am not going to um, spend time. I'm just going to open up for questions. Sri Devi, Mataji, shoot, go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you, India. <laughs> all, the, all the challenging questions from, from as challenging as you can possibly challenge. Marge, I'm sure it's coming because it is all about. <laughs> My humble obeisances to you, Guru Maharaj, all glories to Prabhupada. 
such an interesting topic and so much to learn. Maharaj, I want to understand that whenever Krishna arranges something, there is definitely something for us to learn. But because the situation may be so challenging or so uh, demanding of all the energies we have, we may not, let me say I, I do not understand what's behind it. And because I do not understand, I don't learn the lesson. And so I may be finding myself in the same situation again and again because I haven't learned the lesson. So how can I get, get it? How can I get what Krishna is trying to teach me so that I don't have to repeat the lesson again and again? Well, interesting. Learn the lesson. Here's the answer. <laughs> we got to learn the lesson. We can't remain foolish and then say, well, it keeps happening. The bodies also, they go through that. They keep doing the same thing in the same way and they keep getting the same results. And they're wondering why the same results are happening. Because you're doing the same thing in the same way. <laughs> if you do this, doing the same thing in a different way, you may get a different result. So yes, there's, but... there's, no, there's no excuse. You can't say, well, I can't learn. What does that mean? You have to learn, otherwise you'll continue to go through these situations. You have to learn. That's what this, this philosophy is about. This is what this science is about. Learning how to avoid the trappings and the sufferings of material energy by taking shelter of the process of pure devotion and service. And discriminating between Sufferings that come by way of providence and sufferings that come by way of the arrangement of the Supreme Lord directly. Just like, you know, sometimes it gets so cold out that your finger freezes up and you get frostbite on your finger. You know, you can't blame Christian for that because that's the, that's the, the effect of cold weather. So Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Marcus Sparsis Tripuntaya Sutrasna Sukadukada. The Gafainino Nitsis comes to picture the Bharata, the non permanent appearance of happiness and distress, and the disappearance in due course of time, but like the appearance and disappearance of the winter and summer sun seasons. They come from sense perception of being a bark, and one should tolerate them without being disturbed. So some things in life you just have to tolerate. There's nothing you can do with it. Tolerance is the final stage of that particular answer to that situation. All you can do is tolerate. But there's other situations where tolerance becomes the factor by which you immediately respond to the situation. But then you want to try to go deeper and understand why. And then, then you then you hear from your spiritual master, you hear from the scriptures, you hear from other devotees who can also give you the answer. Or you may understand things through your own contemplation. Hmm. But you can't say, well, I can't learn, I'll never get it. How do you go? <laughs> What's the, use of, what's the use of practicing Krishna consciousness if you can't learn? <laughs> right. Supposed to learn. Right. We're supposed to learn. The books are there. Everything is there. The, the spiritual masters are there. The classes are there. Everything is there. Why do we preach? Or why do we give these classes so people can learn the philosophy and avoid Maya? Mm. And accept Krishna. So you should evaluate your own activities and see because you are doing the same thing in the same consciousness each time you're getting the same results. Mm. But you 
can't say, well, I'll just go to a different place because the answer to that is you carry your consciousness with you from place to place. Right. The change has to be internal, not changing the external. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank yeah. you, Sri Devi. We got Raj. I think Raj had his hand. Yeah, Raj had his hand up. I was going to ask him, Prabhu. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Actually, my question was very similar to Sri Devi Mataji's. I and mean, I was like, I had, I went through something and then I was meditating on what is the lesson, what is a lesson, because it was horrible and I don't want to go through it again. And I came up with like three possible reasons, uh, three lessons, sorry, three lessons that I learned and, and I have to change, change things accordingly. But I don't know if, if they are the lessons that I was supposed to learn or one of them or all of them or none of them. And I just wanted your comments and advice on how do I know if the three lessons that I identified the lessons that I should have learned which, from it? Which one makes the most sense to you? Okay. Or all three make sense. They all make sense to me. They all yeah. make sense to me. So then if, you, if you apply them, then you should avoid those situations that cause, you know, this, that cause that difficulty to occur. If you apply them, then it's that means you you understood the answer. But depending on Krishna also is a big factor in understanding everything. Because mm -hmm. here we have the example of Marge Pariksha. He's asking what who is the cause of your suffering? He could see it right there, the personality of Kali. But still he asks. Therefore, he understands that there may be something else that is not seen and therefore he's asking the bull directly and he got his answer then. Yeah, there are so many reasons why people say suffering occurs. But what is the actual reason? Maybe all of these reasons have some value and that they have elements of truth in them. When people, when something happens to someone, they always say, well, why me? That's the first situation. Why me? Hope that helped, Raj Prabhu. And thank you very much. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Namrata, please go ahead. You had your hand up, Mataji. Yeah, Hare Krishna. So accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, how should we understand the root cause of intolerance, Maharaj? And uh, the connecting question is uh, how should we increase our tolerance? The root cause of intolerance is strong material desires. Material desires do not allow you to be intolerant because something that you want, want to be fulfilled or something you don't want to happen is now happening because your material desire is so strong, you become intolerant. Lust? Lust, yeah. Lust, anger. Anger is a product of lust anyway. Krishna says in the Gita, yeah, it's lust. Which 
is the living entity's natural love for Krishna diverted towards the material energy for sense gratification, which is the foundation by which all material desires spring from. Because we want to enjoy in this material world, we develop desires and, and activities to fulfill that desire for enjoyment. And that's called lust. Material desire is called kama. Kama actually transforms, trans, uh, what's the word? translates into lust ultimately. And Krishna is saying it's lust and lust only that comes in contact with the material mode of passion and later turned into anger, which is the all devouring sinful enemy of this world. So lust is simply uh, love of Krishna diverted towards material energy for, for one's own personal satisfaction. When you want to enjoy here, that's lust. When you want Krishna to enjoy by service, that's love. So how should we uh, try to increase our tolerance? Increase your attachment for Krishna. <laughs> the more you become Krishna conscious, the more the lust level drops and you become more in love with Krishna. And then you're then you're actually coming back to your true consciousness, which is Krishna conscious. <laughs> And lust is not there anymore. Then you'll do only those things that are pleasing to Krishna or favorable for devotional service. So, Maharaj, I'm trying to understand this here. Uh, say with an example that if there is some situation or say a person, we have all of us, you know, we have some person who is always annoying or you know intolerable for us in our life so huh. uh, get rid of it <laughs> yeah huh. but sometimes it happens <laughs> you, or, you or, it or, or, else, or else just learn how to, how to transform that situation into something favorable to allow that to go on is is foolish. Why would you allow people to cause you suffering? That means you actually are actually contributing to your own suffering by allowing that to happen. Mm. You cannot allow people to cause you suffering because you're acting acting against because it's not good for either one of you, either them or you. They suffer because they're causing you suffering. And you're and you're also allowing that, that's another form of, of suffering. So you have to do something to change it. And if you can't, you tolerate it. If it's but if it's too too hard to tolerate, sometimes it is. And you have to do something. Take the necessary steps. Well, yeah, you have to understand it's all based on situation. Not every situation is the same. Hmm. Yeah, like this, I, for instance, there's one girl who was coming to me in Krishna consciousness. Her husband hated the rosies hated Krishna consciousness and did everything we could to stop her. But she kept going. And uh, she tolerated a lot, but she didn't give up her Krishna consciousness. Therefore, she was finding shelter in her devotional service. And But, you know, it was miserable when it was when she was with her husband. But her love for Krishna, her desire to become Krishna conscious was stronger than the situation she was being subjected to because she wanted Krishna more than anything. And therefore, after some time, the situation changed and 
Now the husband's no longer there. He's gone. <laughs> So, and then she got Krishna. So, <laughs> instead of a, an atheistic husband. But it wasn't easy for her. It was years she was going through it. But she tolerated it. And I told her, you do your duty as a wife. So she also had a daughter. And she kept up her duty as a wife. But it was hard. Because he was very inimical. And outwardly, you know, uh, angry. But what can you do in that situation? People, maybe people, another person would act differently. But she followed the advice of superiors and in the course of time, it worked out. Yes, because tolerance can sometimes take years of a person's life. Can. Family members are the biggest enemies. Your enemy outside is not so bad because you can just avoid them. The family members, you can't avoid them. Yes, thank you. I think Indians need to learn a big time lesson in that case. <laughs> it happens all over the world. <laughs> yes. But the Indian, the Indian family is more closely knit than the Western family because the Western society has somewhat uh, broken down the family relationships through economic um, greed, through through capitalism. Prabhupada also said that, he said, many of my devotees came to me easily because they didn't have so much connection with their family. They could, they could easily give up their family and come to the Christian family. Prabhupada saw that. Yeah, the Indian families are sometimes a little bit, they're more stricter or more, the culture is there. But when the families are all together in Krishna consciousness, it's, it's, it's wonderful for everyone. But when they're not, it's, it's hell for those who are trying to practice. Yes, Yes, thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for the thank answer. You. Thank you, Namrata. Yeah, I'm still here. Don't. Uh, so it looks like I'm doing something, and I am. I'm taking care of my karmic reactions right now. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Maharaj. <laughs> <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> Very nice questions, Namrata. I mean, really, really powerful. Thank you. Yes, Silpesh Prabhu, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, when we have to face these karmic tests, am I correct in saying Krishna also gives us the strength and resources to get through them? Yeah, if you turn to him, if you, if you think it's automatic, then you may get disappointed. We should turn to him in these situations. Actually, a devotee doesn't have to turn to Krishna in these situations because the devotee is always with Krishna. That is our program. Some people say, well, you know, when things get difficult, but we're in a difficult situation simply by being in the material world. Full of suffering. Krishna says to Palayama Sasvatam. And especially in Kali Yuga, where the ways that you can suffer have become, you know, 
full blown and increased unlimitedly. And life was more simple. There wasn't so many ways you, you could suffer. You could also suffer, of course, it's always there. But Kali Yuga is it's like an ocean of ways that you can suffer. <laughs> so many ways. But the devotee, therefore, says that uh, always we try to always remember Krishna. When you're always remembering Krishna, then you're in the best situation to get protection from everything. You will get protection. If we forget Krishna, then uh, we're left to our minds, and the minds are never perfect. They can always trick us off by the mind. Krishna says, in all situations, just depend on me. Call out for Krishna, pray for the call out. Somebody was saying yesterday, I think, they were saying, yeah. they were in a situation. Well, I was listening to a tape yesterday. Jananda Maharaj was speaking. He was giving an example, and things became so overwhelming at one time when he was at Bhaktivedanta Manor. And he was in a situation where he didn't do the service he was asked to do was so difficult and impossible, and the people he was wor working under were also the same. So he just threw his hand up and prayed to Krishna. My dear Lord, this is the situation. I, I'm suffering. Please help me. And the next day, someone came to him and gave him a different service, and he was doing something different. As soon as he sincerely prayed, Krishna did something to uh, to remove him from his present situation. That's one example of how Krishna works. If we sincerely pray, and if Krishna wants, he can fulfill that prayer or not. But if you don't pray, how do you know? We don't want to pray because we think we're so intelligent we can figure everything out. <laughs> That's our problem. <laughs> Mark, so, some people have said to me, asking Krishna for help with a material problem. Huh? Some people have said to me that they don't like praying to Krishna to help them with their material problems. They say they yeah. shouldn't. Yeah, there's, there's that class of devotees who have complete faith that why should I ask Krishna for anything? I should always be serving Krishna. Don't ask Krishna for anything. If you're on that level, can you, you can do it. If you're not on that level, don't try to be on that level. For instance, uh, the story in the Shastras, Rupa Goswami was in Vrindavan along with his older brother, Sanatan Goswami. Sanatan Goswami's birthday was that day. And Rupa Goswami is thinking, wait a minute, I'm fighting the noise outside. I'll be right back. Let me shut the window here. So Rupa Goswami wanted to make a nice offering to his brother on his birthday, but he had nothing. And he was just thinking, boy, I'd like to make some nice prasadam for Sanatan Goswami. So while he was thinking, a beautiful little girl from the village came. 
she said to Rupa Goswami, she came to his place, hey, Babaji, I have some, uh, some rice, some milk. It's for you. I want to give it to you. Here. So he's surprised, and he's, he's taking all of these ingredients, some rice, some milk, some spices. And uh, he's so happy. Now he thinks, I can make something for Sanatana Goswami for his birthday. So he cooks and he makes this real nice sweet rice. And then that night he meets Sanatana and he gives him this sweet rice as an offering for his birthday. Sanatana tastes the sweet rice and immediately upon tasting it, he said, where did you get these ingredients? We don't have anything. How did you come by these things? And then Rupa Goswami remembered, oh, there was this nice little girl who came and she gave me all of these ingredients. And then he said, what little girl? Can you describe her? And he couldn't remember completely because he, was, he wasn't interested in so much and he was more interested in getting. But he tried to describe in some way. And then Sanatana Goswami could understand. He said, actually, that little girl was Srimati Radharani. And you have accepted service from Srimati Radharani. He said, this is not good. We should give service to Radharani. We should not be accepting service from Srimati Radharani. So, these are the consciousness of the great souls. They want to serve Krishna and they don't want to be served by the Lord. But at the same time, the Lord likes to serve his devotees. So sometimes the Lord has to trick his devotees in order for him to serve them. And he does that sometimes. Because he loves his devotees and he likes to serve, but a devotee doesn't. Ask anything from the Lord. The Lord wants to give service. The devotee wants to give service. So if you're in a dangerous situation, it depends. If you want to call out for Krishna, nobody's going to say it was wrong. And Krishna is there also. But there's others who won't and simply accept the situation the way it is, knowing that Krishna is always there for his devotee. Anyway. They have that faith. So it depends on your butt <laughs> Thank you, so Marge. You know, you have to choose. Generally, devotees don't bother Krishna, but in very difficult situations, then they they find themselves with no alternative but to take shelter of Krishna. There's Krishna sitting in the heart of every living entity. He's with you always. He never leaves you. And he knows everything. He's, he's always with you, constantly. And you can perceive his presence simply by being, being a little reflective in the way you do things. It's like if you if you want to do something, and but you forget to do something, and then after some time you remember, <clears throat> oh yes, I wanted to do that. That remembrance is Krishna. He reminds you, yeah, you want to do this. Thank you, Maharaj. I hope that helps, Sulkesh Prabhu. Very, very helpful, Maharaj. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Marsh, there's a question in the chat, and then from there I'll, I'll go to uh, Mother Sukhavaha. This is from Badra Prabhu. She said, Hare Krishna, Marsh, please accept Mahamala obeisances. I've heard properly, no, sorry, have I heard properly that allowing someone to make a suffering 
is suffering for us as well as that person also. Uh, if you can explain a little more on that, please. Yeah. Uh, it's obvious. There is a statement about that. Prabhupada makes that statement. If you allow people to do harm to you, you're actually causing harm to yourself at the same time. <laughs> you should not allow people to do harm to you. Because it's not good for them and it's not good for you. So you, how you respond to that depends on what the situation is, who the people are involved are. Mm -hmm. But that's not an absolute principle. Sometimes it's unavoidable. And there's nothing you can do. Depends on the circumstances. We have the story of Tosi Das. When Tosi Das was born, the author of the Ramayan, he was neglected by his, not at first, but people, other people, when they saw him as a little baby, they were thinking he's actually a ghost or some really strange being because he wasn't speaking and he wasn't acting anyway. And then I can't remember all the details. It's written in a particular story. And that uh, as a baby, he was mistreated. He was neglected completely. Mm -hmm. And he was left to die without any shelter as a little baby. But then Parvati, her, she was wife, she came and took the child and took care of the child herself. And she preserved him. And then later on, he met other people who actually wanted to take care of him. And he grew up nicely. But in the beginning of his life, he was completely abused and neglected. And the reason why that happened was because in his previous life, he was Valmiki Muni. And he appeared again as Tulsi Das, both the authors of the Ramayana. And as Valmiki Muni, he was a murderer. And uh, he was converted by Narada. And so some of that residual karma, although he was empowered to write the Ramayana, which is the most authorized thing. He had to go through that suffering in the next life. Because the law of karma is very difficult and very hard to understand. Thank you, Marge. The best thing to do is just stay engaged in devotional service. As soon as you break from devotional service, you put yourself in a situation where anything can happen. And as you stay engaged in devotional service, you're burning up all your previous karma simply by the power of your bhakti. And then at one point, there is no more, nothing coming from the past. It's all now, everything is in the present. And if there's some difficulty, it's simply Krishna giving you a little slap to remind you that uh, what you're doing is not good or something. He's the you know, on site preach, you know, teacher. Krishna. Yeah, devotional service means. You know, staying in, in the spiritual energy. When you're staying in the spiritual energy, you're free from the material. Even if you're a devotee and you're engaged in devotional service and you're being harassed by others, there's two reasons why. One, if you're a pure devotee like Prahlad Maharaj or Srila Prabhupada, then the Lord is using you to glorify the process of pure devotional service. Or Maharaj Pariksha. They were all put into difficult situations just to teach the rest of the world, Arjuna also. Or then Krishna is doing that for some hidden 
reason that you can maybe not see, but it's happening to you for some reason. And that takes a little tolerance in order and some introspection along with advice to understand how to remove oneself from that situation. But one should not allow other people to cause oneself suffering. You can remove yourself from the situation. You can respond to the situation. You can do something. Thank you, Marge. Thank you so much. Um, yes, Mother Sukhavaha, go ahead. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, I think you've answered my question. My question was that, that uh, don't we meet people because of our previous karma or is it due to our ignorance? But you answered it that uh, most of the time it is our karma, which uh, people come and harass us or trouble us. And then we can just, uh, if possible, we can try and escape, but if we can't, then we can just continue our devotional service and eventually it will happen that we will be away from that suffering, isn't it? Okay. Have I understood you right, Guru Maharaj? Generally, if you stay in devotional service, Krishna will mitigate all your suffering and eventually stop it. If you go outside of devotional service to make a solution, then you may, you may increase your suffering. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in any situation, we should be acting to get rid of that suffering. But if we can't do it, then just should accept it as if it was from our previous karma and it will go soon. Right? Uh, uh, yeah. In some cases, it's like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. when, it, when, you know, when, you, when you can't do anything, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you just have to tolerate it and learn from it. That's right. mm -hmm. Also, Guru Maharaj, one more, one more thing. Okay, uh, that sometimes we do get something unexpected, and uh, realizing that this could, this is from Krishna's mercy. But you mentioned that we should not accept any anything like any service from Krishna. How do we? What shall we do? Because we need it, and we we receive it from somewhere, like. It just comes to us. So we shouldn't accept it or we should accept it and just thank Krishna about it. How should we react in that case? If some service comes? Yeah, so, uh, so, so many times it happens to us that uh, we don't even ask for it. It just, we are thinking that we need this thing and it just comes to us without even any effort, basically. Somebody comes and give it, like, you know, you mentioned in that story, somebody comes and give it to you that, oh, look, I've got this one. Do you want it? And you say, oh, my God, this is what I wanted it, actually. So how do, and, and, and we are in desperate need of that, basically. So should we not accept it or should we accept it and say thank you to Krishna because he has organized for it? Well, you have to see if it's good for you or not. <laughs> Is there certain things you want? Most of the time, we really need it, and it comes to us. So, <laughs> the things we want is not necessarily uh, good or need. There's needs and there's wants. Needs, yeah, if any needs is being provided, then you can thank Krishna for that. Okay. But if it's just something you want, it may also be something to thank Krishna, but not necessarily. It depends on what it is. Okay. Sometimes you want something and Krishna doesn't give it to you, but you can continue to want it and then he'll give it to you just to show you you don't need it. You know? <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, he does that makes that sense. Yeah. That does make sense. Yeah, understand things, why things are happening and how things are happening. 
It's the whole basis of this discussion that we're that's based on this section here in the Bible. Very hard to understand. It is very hard, Guru Maharaj. It is very hard. But just stay engaged in devotional service and everything will become easy. As soon as we break from devotional service, then we're under the influence of one of the three modes of material nature. Hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Very nice question again, Mother. Thank you so much. Raj Prabhu, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I feel that there's another lesson out of all of this in that when we go through any difficulty, well, when there's a tendency that we were thinking about I and me, like I have to suffer, this has happened to me, now I can't do this, now I have that problem. Now, I've been reading uh, the biography of Jayapataka Maharaj recently, and he went through so many calamities, but never did was he thinking about I and me. He was only solely thinking about his commitment and services to Srila Prabhupada. And of course, we cannot mimic that, but what we can do is in our life, we can address our priorities. We can think about, uh, you know, get our priorities right. We can think about what can we do rather than focusing on the things we can't do. Uh, there's so many things that we can get straightened out in our normal day-to-day -day life that when we fit, hit the calamities, don't uh, try, we're going to be don't, right. don't try to Sorry. avoid don't don't try to avoid suffering. Just try to uh, engage in devotional service. Next mm -hmm. Because if you try to avoid suffering, you may cause more suffering. That's all. I mean, there's things that you're obviously not going to do. It's just common sense. You know. But if, uh, you know, just like if you think, well, uh, it can't go well because, you know, uh, there may be somebody, some robbers on the street that might attack me and take my money so I won't go out. <laughs> No, that doesn't make sense. In other words, there's people who are so afraid to live life that they don't even do anything that is normal. And they're, they're called, what do you call them? Uh, we call them in the medical thing, they're hypochondriac. They're always thinking they're sick all the time. They're taking this medicine, that pill, this and that. And they're always like, they call them worry wards. They're always worrying about this, worrying about that, worrying about that. And you just can't function like that. That's that's not normal. Follow the laws of normal life and just engage in devotional services. And depend on Krishna. Krishna wants something to happen or allows something to happen. And accept it and try to learn from it and move forward in the Krishna concept. It doesn't mean like, well, if I get sick, I shouldn't do anything. No, you should get some medicine. You have to understand the practical from the more esoteric. The, esoteric, the practical, we just live life. This is ordinary parlance, all the ordinary activities of the living entity. But there's certain things that just come and there's no reason why they came. And you just have to somehow or other face them. Thank you, Marge. The Krishna yes. says, in the cases, just depend on me. <laughs> what else can you do? Depend on him. And that, it's not always something that is unwanted or unpleasant. It's even the, the most dangerous thing in our Krishna consciousness are the niceties in this world. 
these are more dangerous than the, than the, uh, the calamities because the calamities connect us to Krishna right away. The niceties make us forget Krishna and sometimes pull us away simply to enjoy something that is going to be a cause of our fall down. Two sides. Thank you, Marge. Because Marge, it's uh, we cannot avoid suffering, right? It's just going to come upon us. So, so it's like why, why lament or focus on the suffering, but engage in service to not let it dwell on our minds? Is that the way to go to approach, Marge? Krishna says, just tolerate it. It comes and move on and stay fixed in your devotional service. Prabhupada didn't let his difficulties coming over on the boat. And he had three, two heart attacks, plus seasicknesses, and other reverses. But he was fixed on his mission. Therefore, he simply accepted it and then went on with his Krishna consciousness. Yeah. Thank you, Marge. So true. Yep. Thank you. Yes, Srimati, go ahead. Hare Krishna, good morning. Please accept my humble obeisance. Um, thank you for the class and a nice discussion. Um, so I was like uh, thinking about uh, Namrata Mataji's question. Um, and in that uh, context, um, I recently, uh, yesterday, I think I read a quote from His Holiness Radhanath Swami Maharaj, uh, where he's saying that. Even if you uh, expect a, a drop of respect uh, from anyone, you have to come back again into this material world. Um, so I was thinking on that, like, how can we not, like, all the time, I remember this point that we should not expect any respect, but it's very difficult to practice. And uh, especially uh, in the family and the relatives, um, I feel very difficult, Kun Maharaj. So... Um, so with devotees, maybe uh, mind is tuned, <laughs> or um, so it automatically uh, we we don't expect we try to be humble, um, but um, but in the middle of relatives, um, it's very hard to practice this one. So is it? Well, um, well if your children don't respect you, then you have to you have to uh, correct them. <laughs> because yeah. the, in that case, yeah. Because, uh, yeah. But uh, that extended family, Guru Maharaj. Well, what can you do about them? They're, they're who they are. <laughs> what can you do? It's family relations are sometimes like that. They don't agree with you. They, they disrespect you. You say something, they say something. But don't let it get to the point where it, it, it uh, becomes a the reason for argument. Sometimes you've got to tolerate some people's wrong attitudes. They're tolerating your wrong attitudes also. They just go on. If there's some uh, some affection there, then even if there's some dis disharmony or discord, it's not so important if the affection is there. But if there's no affection, then What's the worst thing? Mm -hmm. well, what Radha Swami is saying is that to want respect is a material desire. And if you have a material desire, that means of course you to take birth again. Okay. That's what he's saying. That's a general thing. But, you know, the police have to get respect from the citizens. Otherwise, how can they do their duty? The parents have to take care of their children. Therefore, the, the children must respect their parents by following what their parents say. The disciples have to listen to their spiritual master. They disrespect their spiritual master. It's not the spiritual master says, well, they're disrespecting me, therefore it doesn't matter. No, it's not good for the disciples. It's bad for them. Mm. 
Mm. Yeah, when Brihaspati walked into the assembly with uh, Indra, Indra was there surrounded by all of the principal demigods and he was being worshipped nicely. Brihaspati is the guru of the demigods. He entered into the assembly, he stayed by the door now. And then the worship was going on. Indra saw his spiritual master come in, but he was so enamored by his own worship that he didn't acknowledge the presence of the spiritual master, which was a severe offense. He simply was you know, enamored by his own worship. And then Brihaspati just turned around and left. It's not that Brihaspati came and said, ah, he didn't respect me, that's the thing. No, the disciple doesn't act right, and then the spiritual master, a man or maybe apparently has to do something to correct the disciple. Parents have to do the same thing with their children. Teachers have to do that with their students. When someone accepts subordination under a superior, then there is a reciprocation that has to go on. And uh, the students can't learn if they don't respect or or, or learn or uh, hear from their teacher. The children will go wayward if they don't follow the guidance of their parents, especially when they're in their teenage years, or I mean, up to the age of 14, 15. And if disciples don't follow their spiritual master, then Spiritual master can say, well, it's okay. I just should be, I should be tolerant. I say, no. He has to do something to wake them up to their insolence. <laughs> but he's not acting at a, at a false ego. Parents are not acting at a false ego. Everyone's acting for the benefit of those that they're in charge of. But when it comes to equals, or superiors, then there may be an element of tolerance there. As you said, certain family members, what can you do? This could match, yeah. If it becomes persistent or consistent, then it becomes a very debilitating principle, and then one has to do something to correct it. If it comes up incidentally, then it's not, we just somehow in the college. But if it comes, if it's coming regularly, that means there's some enmity there. That means there's some envy there, or some enmity, or some hatred there. And that, and that can't go on. It's the ameliorating. So, we have to act sometimes. Why are you speaking like that? Sometimes we have to say like that. Yes, Kunash, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yes, Ileana, go ahead. Hare Krishna, please accept my obediences or glories to Srila Prabhupada. Um, why in this uh, era um, the, uh, the animal have uh, uh, better um, intelligence uh, than uh, some uh, uh, person, uh, human? Is a appear appearance or is uh, uh, is is true? Which animal? The the animal in. Uh, the, a lot of animals uh, appear um, have a, a um a good intelligence, uh, and uh, some people. Uh, uh, is uh, have a not good intelligence. It's true. <laughs> Animal intelligence is simply eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Animal has to use his intelligence for getting food, 
So they have intelligence given by God. It's coming from God only. But they, they can find food. They can uh, run from danger. They can build their own little house. And all this is based on their uh, body. That's it. Human intelligence is not like animal intelligence. It shouldn't be. Okay. But if the animal, human intelligence is like animal intelligence, then as Srila Prabhupada would say, they're no better than animals. And human intelligence means to understand what is the purpose of life and how to achieve it. When your intelligence asks the question, why do I have to suffer? How do I get out of suffering? That's intelligence. Animals can't have it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liana. Marge, there is a quote, uh, so there's a post here by uh, Bhakta Saurabh. Let me see. Um, I'm going to go back to his message here. That's your disciple. Not my disciple, Maharaj. I, <laughs> I'm not taking this. No. <laughs> That's karma. <laughs> Hare Krishna. I'm going to do with my... Temple president is the guru. <laughs> with my own karma. <laughs> that is purifying me, Maharaj. <laughs> Rob is I'll help you to become purified. Oh, Maharaj Krishna Chaitanya. That's pretty intense. Maharaj, he his said, choice. Yes, he said yes. He said, yes. He's your shiksha disciple. This guy. <laughs> he's funny. Maharaj, he says, um, thank you for a wonderful class, Maharaj. Uh, His Holiness uh, Lokanath Swami has mercifully agreed to initiate him. Mm -hmm. On request of me, lots of hurdles to reach in location for initiation. Um, he said to please bless him so that he can reach the initiation ceremony and serve Guru Maharaj and Guru Parampara and devotees nicely. Best wishes. Best wishes. Yeah, he's going through his challenges to get from point A to point B <laughs> to get initiation. So he's going through his own purification. Good, good, good. Anyway, I wish you well. Thank you, Mark. Congratulations for taking shelter. Any other questions from devotees? We've had a lot of amazing questions, a lot of uh was a powerful class march i'm so happy that you actually chose to speak on two verses i am so glad because that was a powerful purport the second one verse 22 thank you so much for speaking on it and addressing it and i'm sure no one could have done justice the way you did march amazing amazing points and um i'm and i hope that we all learned and benefited from marge's class and all the questions and answers, are there anything that devotees would like to ask? Any last minute? Like Maharaj, one, yes, Marge, yeah, go ahead. I would suggest that devotees in their different areas get together with a few other devotees and just read this section and discuss it, starting with verse number, I think, 16. And then it starts from 16, Maharaj, yes. 16 all the way up to 23, I think it is. Mm -hmm. the verses and then get into a discussion because there's a lot of points there that are apparently unclear and requires discussion. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting section. Very, very powerful, Marge. Absolutely. Yes. Marge, would you like to end with a round of chanting or do you have something on for? Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y